Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are here on uh, Leadership with Vision. This is just, we're waiting to let a few of you jump in here with us before we start doing the podcast. And you've got Dr. Bush here. And <laughs> he reminds me of his son when he does slide messages the way he does his face there. Uh, seeing if anybody is out there yet on uh, uh, the land, uh, our connection is weak. Oh, my soul, I hate that. Uh, well, let me see here. Uh, uh, we are here. We are broad, uh, broad casting. I can't spell. <laughs> okay, say something here, Jeff. Hello, beloved that are out there in the Facebook land. All hey. right. No one is here, and we are going to go ahead and get started without them, I All guess. All right. We've got a couple. Uh, we got them. three people looking at it, it says, but I don't know who they are. Do you? No, I do not. Not okay. said yet. All right. Well, here we are, guys and girls. Let me go ahead and get everything cranked up for that. We've got Dustin Brown joining us, and uh, we'll just, uh, if you'll watch the, the uh, things down there, Jeff. And, yes, sir. And uh, I will go ahead and get started here. Uh, Dustin, it was sure good to get to meet you in person and have you at the church, and I uh, enjoyed that. Looking forward to how God's going to use you there, my brother. Welcome to Leadership with Vision. This is Austin Gardner and Jeff Bush, and we are excited to talk to you today about uh, uh, activity versus productivity as we're on the mission field and the work that we're doing. Uh, <laughs> hey, Kevin White, uh, uh, listen to me, buddy. Uh, uh, I was here working on a message, getting ready to preach on First Kings chapter 1, Talking about David and how he raised his son for one thing and how the kingdom took place. Really interesting. You know, he's sleeping with his virgin girl, doesn't have any relationship with her. And then his son, Adonijah, wants to have her. So anyway, uh, and uh, so we'll, before we get started talking, who else has joined us there, Doc? So we got Jason Mann in Hungary, Dustin Brown, and Kevin White. That's All right. Doing. Glad you guys are with us. And we're going to, if you want to talk about anything or ask any questions or make any statements, we would like the dialogue. We would like to stay in touch with you and work, uh, work with you through that. And so we are recording the Leadership with Vision podcast. And uh, Jeff, just given a couple of people more time to get on there, uh, would you go ahead and tell them about the summit? Yeah, so we have the summit the uh, last couple of days of the year, uh, December 29th, 30th, 31st. Uh, for the last 10 years, we've had it in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, but since uh, we are uh, prophets and knew that it was going to uh, have a, a fire in Gatlinburg, uh, then we have prepared it now in the Atlanta area. And uh, joking, we're not prophets, um, but we have planned it to be in Gatlinburg, so last Thursday, Friday, Saturday of the year, December 29th, 30th, 31st, we'd love to invite you to come out for a great time. To hear about missions, what's going on around the world, I think it would be a big well, where lesson. do they go if they want to sign up to go and, and be there? Jump on visionmissions.com and um, slash events. Uh, you'll see the info there of all the different breakout sessions, the different classes that you can go to, uh, who's going to be there, some of the missionaries. And uh, it'll be a great time. We have veterans that are coming back from the field, um, guys that are on deputation. It's going to be a wonderful time. Well, we got Jeff Brown and his uh wife have joined us and Trent Cornwell's with us and Brett Johnson. That's great. Glad to have all you guys there with us. Uh, we're going to talk about activity versus productivity today because it is so easy to stay busy. Every pastor you've ever met is extremely busy. He may only have a church of a, a few dozen people, but he's extremely busy. And everybody you ever meet is always busy. That's just part of the thing. So maybe a question to ask, because as a missionary, you're going to be doing things that far above what the average pastor does. You're going to be involved in training leaders, leaving churches, starting multiple churches, preaching many more times. And just to be honest, you'll be doing things that the average pastor doesn't spend much time doing. So you must learn uh, the difference between activity and productivity. So we got to understand uh, how to be occupied uh, doing the right things because most people are very occupied and very busy, but they produce very little. But as a missionary, you're not going to have that option. You're going to be doing a whole lot of uh, ministry. Uh, Jeff, why don't you share any kind of story about maybe what life was like for you on the field as we get started? Well, for a lot of time for missions and a lot of my missionary friends are listening here. 
Uh, a lot of times on the mission field, it's the same, pretty much the same life as it is in the United States or wherever you are. Uh, but you have to remember your priority, and that's we've talked a lot about that. Um, you know, doing the normal things as far as when I was in Argentina, we'd wake up, you know, have breakfast, and go preach on the radio, and then hey, what uh, make time some would visits. You be preaching on the radio? I preach from eight to nine in the morning, Mondays yeah, to Fridays. Monday through Friday. Yes, sir. And so, so uh, if you wanted to leave town, what'd you have to do? Uh, I had to, well, I would re try to pre-record or I'd set up some of the other guys that would be uh, preaching that day. And so I had to plan and make sure that that was taken care of before I left. All right, go ahead. You were telling us what else you did? And so I would leave from there. Um, I would usually leave around 7 so that I can get there about 7.30, have a little bit of time to think set up. Um, and then I would preach from 8 to 9. After that, I went to usually a coffee shop. And um, I did some more reading, some studying, and then I hit some house visits, and then I went home for, I was almost always home at lunchtime. That was our meal when we would eat together as a family, and because uh, usually I was out in the evening at Bible College. And what time uh, did y'all eat lunch there? Um, lunch was normal time as far as 12, 12 30, 1 o'clock. Okay. Now, um, you know, in my case, it was uh, literally, I took the kids to our Christian school that we had started. And then uh, I was in the Bible college for about uh, from eight o'clock to about one or two o'clock every afternoon. I had to grab lunch uh, or a snack wherever I could. I would be home to eat lunch maybe two thirty or so, and this is after things got really rolling. And uh, then I would be preaching uh, nearly every night of the week except Monday and Saturday, and uh, preaching several times on Sunday. That calls. That's a lot of activity. So you got to know where you're headed. You got to be able to separate what you're. Why are you doing what you're doing? Make a list of priorities. What are you trying to accomplish? You know, I'm sorry, Pastor. Go ahead. Um, you know, even in our daily lives right now, um, it's very easy if we want to get on, check some email or whatever. If we don't have a plan for the day or for what we're supposed to be doing during the week on the mission field or here on deputation or wherever, it's so easy to get busy and get distracted. You know, get on the email, you follow through check a video out, and you go to the next one. You can lose so much time, and you were busy doing things, but what did you accomplish? And so that's what the whole this whole lesson is about. We want to accomplish things, not just be busy about doing things. Now, what I'd like to challenge you to do is to be so busy, you can't get all the work done. So like, it's, you never, you're going to learn to delegate, but you never delegate to get other people to work so you don't have to. You delegate to get other people to work so you can do a different job. So if you're extremely busy, if you're doing a lot of work, if, you're, if you are preaching a bunch of times, starting more churches, or all of that, you can't. For example, nobody wants you to tell them they need to be the janitor at the church just because you don't like to sweep floors. And no one wants to do anything just because you don't want to do it. They want to do it because they feel like it's needed and it's vital. So we're going to use delegation to train people to do ministries that need to be done. You know, delegation, we've even spoken a little bit about this in the past, but delegation is not just throwing work that you don't want to do onto somebody else. Um, nobody wants to do that job. That's why, you know, uh, you got to eat that frog first or, you know, you got to take care of those things. Nobody wants to do it. But when we talk about delegation, that comes from Exodus, what is it, Exodus 32, Exodus 30, when uh, Moses' father-in-law comes out, where we get a good biblical principle of it, and he says, look, you're busy the whole day, but really you're not accomplishing a whole lot. you still got lines of people, still a whole lot that needs to be done in this city, and if you do not lead the people in the right way by getting those that are capable and giving them the job, teaching them how to do it, and then handing it over to them, things will not be done. So Moses was very busy but Moses was not being strategical. He was not being smart. And as a missionary, we don't want to be just busy. We want to reach more people with the gospel. But you have to delegate. You have to give good jobs to other people and then help them get them done so that more work can be done, more people can be trained, more souls can be reached, uh, more churches can be planted, and more things can happen on the field. So when you start a church, you are the one who opens the door. You're the one that gets the building clean. You're the one that gets the chairs set up. You're the one that locks the doors. You're the one that lays out the song books or turns on the projector and the computer. You're doing all the work. So as you go along building your church, you're looking for a way to get more and more people involved in the ministry. And so if it's just, I don't want to do this, I want you to do it, they won't enjoy doing that. 
They need to do it because they really see that they are needed. They don't need to be used. They need to be utilized. They don't need to be used. They need to be utilized. And so what you're going to do is, is if, if I have more than one Sunday school class to teach, then I need another teacher, so I'll train a teacher. I'm not just training a teacher to train a teacher. I need another teacher. I need someone to lead singing. I need someone to take up the offering. I need someone to do uh, 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 counseling at the end of the service. I need someone to open the church because I'm going to be at another church. I'm starting another church, and I'm over here preaching. I won't be at the main church to get it open, to get everything set up. I need you to do that because I am so busy, I can't get everything done I need to get done. You know, you can divide up, um, even be a little bit creative on how you're going to get so much done. I would say encourage the people. Uh, pastor's already mentioned it, but... You know, we don't just throw out the job and then just say, do all this. Um, if the expectation without the explanation of how to do it, it leads to frustration. And so we explain to them, this is what needs to be done. Obviously, if we're going to have a good service tonight, then we have to have all the, the planning for it. So I need you to get here. I need you to turn on the lights, make sure the seats are, are ready. And then I'll get here. We're going to pray about it. And then we're going to kick off this service. And so make it exciting, everything that's being done and recognize them and thank them for it. And when you do, a lot more people want to get involved. You know, everybody wants to get involved in ministry. Everybody wants to be uh, feel like they're useful. Uh, but it's kind of your attitude on, hey, man, let's help out. All together, we're going to get this. I heard, I think it was uh, Bear Bryant said, if something bad happens, it's my fault. Something good happens, it's um, to your credit. If something great happens, all of us get the credit. And so uh, we share that. But when we delegate, don't just throw it off and then walk away. You give it to them, and then you help them, and you follow up with it, and you show them it can be done. So uh, people in Latin America would come late to church. Uh, well, they, they didn't need to get there early uh, because everything was going to be done for them. If they showed up on time, fine. If they showed up late, fine. And so it didn't matter. So when I started showing them, I needed them. I could not do the ministry without them that I was there to help them do the ministry, that I was going to be leaving the ministry to them and I was going somewhere else, they began to take ownership of that ministry and they began to do the ministry like, like it was really theirs. So I am going to make me a list of everything I'm doing and then I'm going to try to find out as many people as I can to plug into different ministries so they could all help me do the ministry. I want as many people as possible helping me do the ministry. I do not want to do the ministry. I want to train people to do the ministry. There is a massive difference in that. I don't want to do the ministry. I want to train people to do the ministry. So I will be delegating. I'm going to delegate out everything. Before it's all said and done, I'm going to be like the coach sitting on the sideline while they make all the touchdowns, while they catch all the passes, while they do all the, all the ministry. So I'm challenging you to learn how to delegate, learn how to give somebody else a ministry to do, and learn how to correct them when they're doing wrong, how to develop them so that they can feel great success in doing it, uh, and teach them to be teaching someone else to do the ministry, and never, ever dump work simply because you don't like doing it. You know, I'm going through a book right now. It's, it's called uh, Developing the Leaders Around You. And in the book, it says, great leaders lead well. And obviously, uh, there are men who lead very well, and that's a good thing. He said, but uh, although good leaders, better said, lead well, great leaders always develop leaders around them. So they're delegating, they're helping, they're raising up great leaders. You know, all not just because someone's a good basketball player or sports player doesn't make them a good coach. And so uh, they have to have a certain way of helping and encouraging and, and you know, showing how the things get done so that they can be a good coach. And it's your job. It's your responsibility as a missionary. You don't want to just do all the good work, all the work and be a good player. You want to be the coach. You want to be able to help others do it. You're going to delegate, as Pastor was saying, delegate, teach them how to do it, and then give the jobs out and let them do it. Let them be leaders. So you are helping other people. You're developing them. You're letting them do ministry. You're not dumping work on them. That's the first thing. Do so much work. You have to have help. Please don't fall into the rut of doing ministry. The second thing I would say is you need to be disciplined and have a schedule. So the truth is that this is the first time you've been on your own. When you're in, uh, you know, when you work at a factory, when you work at a job, you have a check-in time. 
When you're in college, you have a time yet to be at class. And all of a sudden, for the first time in your life, you're a missionary and you're on deputation. And deputation missionaries get lazy because they don't want to get up. They don't see the need of getting started and, and making their phone calls. There's no one. There's no check-in time. There's no card to punch. And then they get to the field, and it's even worse because now they never see the people that pay them. They don't even have to show up for church on time. And missionaries get very lazy because they, they aren't disciplined and they don't have a schedule. You know, um, all right, we have several more friends that have joined us. Uh, Jamie Smithy from Chile, Jonathan Anderson from um, from Mexico, Raleigh Hill headed to Argentina, Miguel Sanabria headed to Colombia, Jesse Turpin, Indonesia, a lot more. Thanks, guys, for uh, visiting with us. Appreciate it. We'd love to have conversation with you if you want to throw some things this way. Um, we're talking about um, being not just active, being productive in what we do and uh, getting the job done. We want to delegate. And then the next point, we talked about being disciplined. If I could say something, Pastor, um, I believe one of the biggest problems personally, not just in missions in a lot of areas, is being self-disciplined. You know, when you become a missionary, um, nobody's going to tell you when you wake up. Nobody's going to tell you when you have to, if you have to make visits or if you have to study or, um, you know, how you're going to do different things. You have to have the discipline yourself to wake up to say, this is on my list. The pastor used to say, you know, uh, plan your schedule and then let your schedule control your life. Let it tell you and push you what to do. And so I'd plan so many things, almost like what we mentioned, plan so many things that you can't necessarily get them all done. But because you schedule them, it kind of controls you. It becomes your boss because as a missionary, you are your own boss. And that's good, but it's also a scary thing if you're not self-disciplined. Well, it's, you know, I think maybe it's not as scary as it is lazy, comfortable. Because all of a sudden, what time do you need to get up? What time do you need to go to bed? Uh, when do you need to study? Have you ever heard a preacher say, I can't get a message till Saturday night? I can't get my message for Sunday morning until Saturday night. I can't get a message until, uh, you know, un until it's the last minute. I, I need it on my heart. I need it fresh. Well, much of that is a lack of discipline. And what they're saying is, I only study well when I'm under pressure. I only study well when I know I've got to get it and get it now. Uh, when Jeff came in, I was working on my message for Thursday night, and already I have been working on Thursday night's message, Sunday morning's message, and Sunday night's message. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I, I was working on them last week. Not to brag about that, just to say that I can make myself think I have to have this done. Now, my plan is that I will be finished with Thursday night's message today. Tomorrow we have a staff uh, planning day to work on our next year's calendar. That's going to really mess me up. I never know what's going to happen. I don't want to wait till Thursday to get my message because what if something happens and, and at the last minute I don't have time and then I, I, don't, uh, I won't have a way to make myself get it done. And I could shoot from the hip. That's what a lot of preachers do. You know, the Holy Spirit just led me in a different direction, gave me a different message. I'll preach something old. And, uh, but I set up another thing where I send out my outlines uh, in an email. And so if I don't send them out, everybody know I didn't get my outline. And uh, so I'm doing things to make myself have to be accountable. You know, the self-discipline, um, that can hurt you in so many areas. If you don't discipline yourself to, uh, to take your wife on a date, if you don't discipline yourself to uh, read the Bible, to read books, to, uh, to grow in your own life, to spend time with your family, to um, you know, help other leaders, to plant. There's so many ways that this can become self-destructive if you're not self-disciplined. And so I encourage you, you know, start disciplining yourself, whether it's, you know, physical, whether it's spiritual, mental, however it is, you as a missionary, you have to discipline yourself to say, I'm going to do these different things. These are things that are going to get done. And once you work on those different things, you might not see all the, um, all the success tomorrow, but you know what? If you work at it and work at it and work at it and work the, the plan and the process, at the end of it, you are going to have a product. And it is going to look beautiful. And things are going to happen because you've worked at it long enough. But nothing happens overnight. And so if you don't work at it, if you don't discipline yourself, don't even expect that you're going to have a lot of people come on Sunday if you haven't been working at it. Well, you've heard uh, uh, plan your work and work your plan. And uh, so I just would like to say to you, there's a Spanish saying, or at least in Arequipa, there was a saying that little by little, 
you go a long ways. Poco a poco se llega lejos. And uh, in English, I think we say inch by inch, it's a cinch. By the yard, it's hard. And so, you know, uh, I was reading a book yesterday and the old British Empire, people that worked in Uganda, when they would get a six month furlough, they gave them eight months because they had to walk 800 miles out to take their vacation. <laughs> so, <Good night. laughs> so uh, because there was no modern transportation yet. <laughs> and so when they wanted to furlough back in England, it took them a month to get out. Uh, I don't even know how you'd walk 800 miles in a month. <laughs> I don't even understand that. But anyway, the point being, you have to plan your work. You have to figure out what am I going to be doing and how am I going to get it done? So you want a schedule and a to-do list. You want to say, all right, I'm going to do this at this time and this is what I've got to get done. And that's how you're going to become productive and not just active. Uh, I'm shocked that men who run major million dollar businesses can answer their phone and answer a text and a pastor running 50 is too busy. You know what? We all have to, maybe we should push on this a, a little bit more, but uh, we have to put the priorities in our life. We have to see exactly what's happening. You can get a lot done, but if you're not self-disciplined, you can't get a lot done and you won't get a lot done. And so I challenge you, you know, whether you do it on paper, whether you do it on your computer, whether you, you know, have it in your mind, have, have a goal. The goal is, this is what the goal is, but if you're not self-disciplined, you'll never reach the goal. That's your to-do list. That's your task list. That's all the things that need to be done so that you can get the job done. As a missionary, you have to be self-disciplined to get the job done. So make a schedule and make it understandable. Don't be overly broad. So, you know, sit down first and say, here's my God stuff. Uh, do you have a disciplined plan for your Bible reading and study and Bible pr and prayer? My people stuff. Well, when am I going to do what with people and how am I going to be doing it? The other junk that I have to get accomplished, how am I going to get that done? Uh, so there are several things about being productive and uh, not just active. And that's, uh, that's some of it. So you want to schedule everything. Let your wife do many of the things that may waste your time on the mission field. Your wife can go to the bank and the market and the store. Your wife can not. Maybe in, I've heard that in some of the uh, Arabic countries, that's almost not possible. I can't answer that question. Uh, I don't know about those countries, but in, a, in most of the free countries, your wife should be able to do regular life. You know, uh, there were so many times when I was in, Argentina that I get so bogged down so easily. Everybody wanted to spend a little bit of time with you uh, on visiting. Everybody wanted to talk a little bit, and then I can run, and man, Sunday's coming up. Um, I started this church, so I need to do this. If I'm not careful, I'm doing all the bulletins, and I'm getting everything ready, and I'm cleaning up, and there's so many things that I did that if I was not careful, they would consume all of my time. So I had to start delegating those things off so that as we began talking about it, but then I had to say, you know what, what are the things that I can do that only I can do? What are the things that I'm doing that other people can help me do? And I had to start delegating those things off, prioritizing what is the most important. You have a big list, you have a goal. So out of that goal, what are all the tasks that needs to be done? Maybe there are things that you are doing that you shouldn't be doing or that are just consuming your time. They're just making you very busy, but just because you're busy, you know, it might be like a dog chasing its tail. Just because it keeps going in circle and it gets its exercise doesn't mean it got anywhere. Well, you know, yesterday uh, we were in the nursing home and uh, visiting my mother. And uh, as we were walking down the hall, a nurse came up behind me. And uh, Betty, between my mother and my wife and me, we had filled up the hallway. She couldn't get by. And I told Betty, I said, honey, step aside. There's a lady behind us needs to get by. And she said, oh, not in a hurry. I work eight hours, no matter whether I get there quick or low, slow, I gotta get fill up my eight hours. You can't work that way. You can't work that way. So most of our lives we've spent saying, well, as long as I turn in my hours, I'm done. But that's not the way it's gonna work as a missionary. You've got much more to accomplish than that. So you're gonna need a schedule. Uh, I always say this and I will say it again, it is best to get out of your house. Uh, Lord willing, in just a few weeks, we will have a new church building and I'll have an office. And I plan on being in my office at 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to get down there. I'm going to get away from the house. I want to be able to leave my house, leave my social life, leave my family time, go do my ministry and come home. Now, I work all the time here, but I get so bogged down in junk I shouldn't. I get so bogged down in 
answering emails and text and glide and keeping up with everything that's going on that I'm often not as productive as I should be. And so let's get that part straight. All of us can become busy. We cannot forget that. It is so easy to be busy on your computer, with the text, with the emails, with the videos, writing this, thinking up this. That's not the point. We do not want to just become, I don't mean to belabor this, we don't want to just become busy. There were good men that I knew on the mission field that were busy and did not have time to do the most important things, to train leaders, to help men, to get things, but they were always busy. But ministry wasn't, and it's not about, I'm not saying it's about numbers, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying they were so busy, but yet they were struggling in ministry, and they couldn't get things, so it's not, we're going to prioritize. After you get all these lists of you, these goals and these tasks, then what's the most important? What's the only thing that you can do? And as a missionary, your priority is you want to leave somebody in your place before you leave. If that's so, then that means in every day, your goal is going to be showed up, shown up in what your everyday task is. So what are you doing today? Are you working on that? Are you pushing that direction? Does your schedule, your calendar, does it look like that you are training leaders, that you're trying to work on this? That's what you want to do. You want to prioritize. I would block my calendar. I would, in other words, I'd put in block times for study, block times for reading, block times for praying, block times for training. If I were you, I would go ahead and put in my calendar, I need my midweek message done by this time. You pick that time. And you say to yourself, if I'm not done by then, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I have to have it done. No choice. Because we all get our messages done when we have to. And that's Saturday night or Sunday afternoon or Wednesday night. And, and we don't want to do it that way. So let's say uh, by this time, I will have that message done. By this time, I'll have that message done. And by this time, I'll have that message done. By this time, I'll have the Sunday school lessons prepared and what I have to put out. By this time, I'll have my prayer letter done. In other words, it's just a matter of saying, this is my deadline when I have to have this done. You know, we can get in so much trouble uh, if we don't schedule things. And I realize there's some people say, I don't need to use paper and I don't need to use pen or write it down. I know what I'm doing. But let's be honest, we will all have a date with our wife when we want to, or we'll all get around to, you know, writing a lesson or getting a message or, you know, doing whatever. We're all going to do all these different things, but we'll never get it done if we don't plan it. And so we have to, pastor said, block it out. So when are you going to take a date with your wife? I mean, you're not, you're going to wait until it's a big fight and they're like, fine, I'll take you out. Is that all you need? You know, and, um, or then you get up and 10 minutes before you say, oh God, please give me a message. I don't have anything to say. You know, when are we going to get things done? Block it out and plan it. So I believe a, a planned life will be a more tranquil life because when you plan it out, then you can go ahead and do it. And then it just comes natural. And so that's what you want to do as a missionary. That's what you want to do to get things done, to train the leader. You plan all these things. You purposeful. You are very purposeful in what you do and how you do it. Uh, we have had Chris Way to London, England join with us, and there's Daniel Sparks going to Chile and leaving very shortly. There's Luke Moore, a student, Michael Rastelli on his way to Bosnia and on his way to his uh, 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 survey trip in just a few days. There's Greg Keelan, glad you're with us, and Courtney Martin. I don't know if I think that's got everybody. Uh, so so uh, the thing is, you're going to only work around 50 or 60 hours a week. That's what you want to work. That's it. Uh, and, and, and after that, you need some free time. You know, you're going to sleep 56 hours. Uh, that's eight hours a night. You're going to work 60 hours. That's 116 hours. And that still leaves about 42 more hours that you can have family time, fun time, and all that. And you can, in your 60-hour work week, you can put your devotional time in there if you want. You, you can count uh, service times in that if you want, uh, because that's a lot of time in a week's time. And, and our church people are doing that. So what I want to do is I want to I want to plan that. I want to say, this is what I'm doing then. That way I can take a break, go home, and spend time with my wife, whether it's going out shopping or watching TV or going out and, and, and doing a sport together or whatever. But I definitely, after that time, I need some time with my wife. I need some time with my children. They're not going to be with us long, so I've got to spend time with my kids when I can. So I've got my 60 hours of work. I've got my 60 hours of sleep. That's 120 hours, if you want to count it that way. And that's, that still leaves 48 more hours 
with a lot of stuff that you can get done and uh, you can that, that's fam, family time and and all that other sort of thing so remember this you can't be selfish and say i worked my 60 hours and now i need time for me because you can't count your golf game or your time out with the boys as family time you know, I remember several times in my own life uh, when I was serving on the field that I would feel like I was getting burnt out. And to be quite honest, looking looking back or even at that moment, uh, many of those times they were my own fault. I wasn't planning things. I wasn't scheduling in the right way. And I was busy, but I wasn't necessarily productive. I wasn't getting. I was not getting things done. And so if I would have stopped and I would have said, I need to, you know, my own activities, I need to be reading to grow myself, I need to be visiting, I need to be studying for the messages, I need to spend time with my, if I would schedule things and plan things out, then I wouldn't be so burnt out. Like, uh, you know, sometimes we work the, all the time, we think. We're not necessarily getting anything done. Then we get discouraged. And then because we're getting discouraged, then it just weighs upon us. And then we get sick and then everything happens. You know, we can stop and go ahead and schedule it out, plan it out. And we can get a lot more productivity with our time. So let's put in our schedule some reading time. That's important. Let's put in some study time. That's important. You can put in fixing motors or building furniture. If you do, that's just not ministry time. Because you, honestly, you can hire that done. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with visiting hospitals. There's nothing wrong with making house visits as long as you are really working it. So don't go by yourself. Take somebody with you. Uh, train somebody else to do it. The idea is that you won't be so busy doing busy work. You want to you have something. So make sure you have time for the family. Make sure you have time for the wife. Make sure you have time for you to learn and grow and make sure you have plenty of time for, you need your sleep, you need uh, your exercise time or whatever that is, but then you're going to work a schedule to get the work done. You know that um, even that personal time, um, if you're so busy that you don't have time to, whether it's read or listen, something with your, for your personal growth, you can really hinder yourself. Even that time with the Lord, there are certain things that if you do not make time for it, you know, I remember uh, many times I woke up, man, I had to get going. I had to get rolling and I don't have time to, to read or to pray or to think with the Lord right now. And I don't have time to read myself or, you know, and I got busy and I went all through the day, come the end of the minute. I thought, man, I've been busy today. And I just fall down and sleep. And day after day after day, it goes like that. And I don't read for personal growth. I don't, you know, get close to the Lord. And because of that, then I start suffering and we start suffering. And that's not God's fault. And it's not ministry's fault, and it's not my family's fault. That's my fault. I've got to schedule those things out. So as we're talking about how to be productive and not just active, don't get distracted with little things, like checking your email every three minutes. A link and an email takes you to YouTube, and then Twitter, then Facebook, and back to email, and back to YouTube. And four hours later, you still haven't got anything done, but you've been busy. Uh, I don't. <laughs> nothing to say there. Nope, guilty. <laughs> Hell, be, be held accountable for your time. It's hard. It's not hard to stay busy. It's just hard to be working. It's not hard to be active. It's just hard to be productive. It's not hard. You know, everybody will try to figure out every way not to do what needs to be done. Uh, I don't want to make phone calls. I'm on dictation. I don't want to make phone calls. I can figure out plenty of things to keep me busy. I really don't feel like sitting down and studying a hard passage of scripture to preach. Plenty of things to keep me busy. I don't really want to go spend time in a foreign language where I'll feel embarrassed. Plenty of things to keep me busy. So if you're not careful, you will waste your life. You know, I think that's a great point about um, holding yourself accountable, um, being accountable in different areas. Um, you know, we do that in a lot of different ways. You can hold yourself accountable with your devotions by when you finish, you write something out and you send, you email it. And then you know that you did it and you say, well, that's not the right motive um, because if I'm doing my devotion just to send it out or, you know, I've got to study, so I'm blocking it out in my calendar or, calendar or, you know, all these different things. You can do so many different things or you're in language school. We'll say from 8 to 12, that's my language school. And, you know, your language school teacher, even if it's a personal tutor, you have them come to your house and you have to do it. You, in other words, you have and to you force yourself. You don't take care of the baby. You don't check email. You don't do things that waste the time 
that the tutor's there with you. You have to keep yourself accountable. Have somebody else keep you accountable. Have another mission. Hey, give me a call at this time. I just finished um, The Purity Principle by Randy Alcorn. Great book. And he said one of the big things, if you want to be um, pure, you know, there's pure versus impure, which is wise versus unwise. And he said, if you want to be pure, he said, uh, be smart enough to have accountability partners. You know, somebody say, hey, man, call me at this time or hey, do this. He said, uh, those things don't happen by accident. It's on purpose because you're accountable to someone or to something or how you're going to do. You're going to go to sleep and you say, okay, I'm not looking at my computer when my wife goes to sleep or I'm not doing, and I don't mean to get us off track. All I'm saying is you want to be accountable. So make yourself accountable. Force yourself to do things. Make it where other people ask you questions or I have to finish my prayer letter. I have to finish visiting somebody so that you are accountable and you are forced. Remember, you're planning it and then you're letting that that schedule plan and push you to do what you're supposed to do. All right. I noticed Brian Reese, Mr. of Thailand's with us. Glad to have you, brother Brian, and I hope things are going well for you. Uh, we are talking about activity versus productivity. So here's some questions for you. What is your priority? What is your priority? So the first thing you got to do is sit down and say, who am I and what am I trying to accomplish? Who am I and what am I trying to accomplish? What do I want to be known for? So what you want to do is you want to say, all right, am I a pastor? Am I a leader trainer? Am I a church planner? Am I an evangelist? Uh, what am I known for? What, what do I want to do? And so I decided I wanted to be a leader trainer, which meant that it would turn my schedule upside down. I am more interested in training leaders than I am in preaching messages. I'm more interested in training leaders than I am in uh, studying a book for me. I am more interested in training leaders than I'm any other thing. That's my goal. That's what I want to be known for. That's going to take precedence in my schedule. And so you might be thinking, you know, what does that have to do? Of course, I'm a, I'm a preacher and I'm a Christian and I'm a, you know, all these different things. Well, you have to narrow it down because if you don't know who you are, one, you can't convince other people of what you're doing. You're not convinced yourself. And so, like Pastor said, if you're a leader trainer, if you're this church planner, if you're this whatever you are, then that is what you know, kind of determines what your calendar, what your schedule looks like, and what you do during the day, what all your activities are about, because you know who you are and what you're supposed to be doing. I always used to tell the students back in Arequipa when they would come down, Americans, I would say, write your obituary. You just died, write your obituary. Uh, a friend of mine is a pastor, uh, it's really more of an acquaintance, but a pastor resigned from a church here in the area. And people are putting on Facebook stuff like, you know, I was his secretary and there would be times when he would tell me nobody could talk to him and he was take no calls because he was going to be studying and praying. And I, I just remember that. And I could see him when he came out and how he felt and how he was doing. And I read that and I thought, man, that is so beautiful testimony. So you've just died and people are talking about you. What are they going to do? They're going to say, you wrote a lot of books about the Bible. You preached great messages. You were a great pastor. Uh, uh, you trained a lot of leaders. What did you do? Because you need to know the end now so you can get to that end. It's the goal. It's like playing football. If you don't know where the goal line is, you're going to have a hard time making touchdowns. You know, all of us, in one way, all of us are going to leave a legacy. But the great thing is we get to choose what kind of legacy we want to leave to our children, to other Christians, to missionaries, to friends. And so right now we're choosing by the decisions that we make, by what we do and what our schedule looks like. And that's all leading up to it. So what do you want to do? I remember the first time pastor encouraged me, this was many years ago in college. He said, write your obituary. And so I sat down and I wrote and uh, it was probably something goofy. I don't even remember. But I remember thinking. Going to marry a girl who had 25 kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm, ha I'm, I'm not halfway there, but I'm going for that, that way. But, you know, I remember all, writing all these different things down, and uh, that made me think a lot. You know, I mean, we're not just floating through life. We're not, and I know I'm preaching in the choir because I'm talking to, to men who are serving God. But you know what? Maybe it would be good for you to stop and just to write it down and think about it. What do I want to be known for? Because if that's what it is, that's who I am, then these are the things that I need to start doing, and these are the goals that I must have. And so this is how my schedule should start looking right now. I want to get to the field. Well, start the calling. I want to get these messages. Well, start studying. I want to get these leaders. Well, start looking for them. You know, all these things could be broken down into tasks. Who do you want to be at the very end of it all? What words are associated with your name? So when they say your name, what words are associated with your name? 
Actors are known for the role they play. Uh, you know, Andy of Mayberry is Andy Griffith. He is uh, Opie's dad. He's a sheriff of Mayberry. We'll know him that way. You know, he, he played other parts. Uh, he was a lawyer named Matlock, but you are, he is known for what he did. Uh, his personal life was maybe nothing like what he was acting out, but he's known for that. So what are you going to be known for? Are you known for being a preacher, expository preaching, discipleship, leader training? What are you known for? That's going to be uh, one of the things we want to ask ourselves. What are we known for? You know, put the taglines down. I still believe it did me a lot of good, and I've done it more than once. And um, I even encouraged uh, when we served at a Bible college in Argentina, uh, the Lord allowed us to start. I had all the, the pastor, those who are pastors now, all the students, that they would write out their obituary. You know, put all those, what do you want? You know, who are you? He was, um, you know, a great father. He was a preacher. He loved people. He was a good Christian. He was a, you know, write all these things. I think it would be good for all of us. It would make us think. And what do you want to be? That'll kind of control what you kind of do in your life. I don't mean this ugly, but here it goes. Pastors are a dime a dozen. I am a pastor, so I'm attacking myself. But don't be just another pastor. Be a church planning, disciple making, leader training pastor or something like that. Don't just be a regular guy. You can make a decision now about who you are and what you're going to accomplish. I would encourage you, once you know what you want to do, who you are, those titles that you're putting in there, start studying it. You say, well, I want to be a disciple maker. Well, there's great books on that. Master Plan of Evangelism, Disciple Making Pastor by Bill Holden. There's some great books. Uh, 12 Ordinary Men. There's some great books you should do. Well, I want to be, you know, this kind of preacher. There's some great books. You know, anything you say, start studying that because you can become a professional. The great thing is, you know, when we were in school, we had to study certain things, whatever the teacher told us to. Right now, we get to choose what we study. I think that's beautiful. Because now you say, I want to be good at this. You know how many books there are on that? You know how many people you can talk to? So study and be the best there is in that, in that area that you want to be good in. Of the people who know me, do they, what do they associate me with? So when people say my name, what do they associate me with? Do they say, you know, for example, it is a common thing in America to say uh, that's his church. That's Austin's church. That's Tom's church or whatever. Uh, but so when people, when they talk about you, are you just a missionary to that country? Are you training leaders? What are you accomplishing and what are you doing? Jonathan Anderson, Mexico, our friend says, when we started the church here, I made a 10 year plan and it's exciting to see how God is bringing those things to pass even in the first two and a half years. Amen. Make a plan. Plans can be thrown away and changed, but if you have a goal, at least you're working towards something. You can be known so much as one thing that it hinders you from doing other things. So don't just get locked in, but at the same time, start planning how you're going to work at doing this. You want to be productive, not just active. That's what we've been trying to say. Okay, how do I choose what I want to be? How do I choose what I want to be? You can't be me, and I can't be you, and he can't be me, and I can't be him. So uh, I just need to find what my gifts are, what my calling is, and I need to do a lot of things on purpose. I need to decide, okay, I can pastor my church. I can train some men. I can't, what can I do? You know, um, it was very frustrating for me, still is. Sometimes I get carnal and start thinking about really um, dumb things. I compare myself with others and I get beat up and I feel bad. But the truth is, I, there are things I can do that God made me to do, and I can be active, and I can be used of God, and that's what I'm challenging you to work on. I think you will be, any of us, all of us, will be pr very productive and when we use our strengths. And God gave all of us strengths, areas that we are better in. That doesn't make us better than another person, but that means that we should be using what God has given us. So find out what God has given you and what's natural to you. Do those things. Work in the other areas. Become the best in those areas. But at the same time, God has given you something. Man, work that hard. Work it good. Hone it down and become the best at it. Well, we are really coming to an end of this particular <coughs> session on being productive and not just active. And I would welcome any questions or comments. If we don't get any, we're going to shut down. But maybe you have something you'd like to add. If you'll just type it in the comment section there right quick. 
We'll read it. We'll answer any questions. We'll make your comment public here uh, because I know that you want to be active and productive. You don't want to just waste your time. So if you're still listening and you have a comment or a question, why don't you do that right quick? And while you're doing that, um, let me throw out very quickly, the end of the year is approaching rapidly. We're almost in December. Uh, the very end of the year, we have the Our Generation Summit. I would love to invite you. Um, it's the December 29th, 30th, 31st. First time we're going to have it here in Atlanta, uh, Lake Lanier Island. You can find out more, visionmissions.com slash events. And uh, we would love to invite you. It's going to be an excellent time. Um, Please, you know, we'll be posting different things. You can share those different things. I think it'll be a great encouragement to you, a help for you. If you can come at the end of the year, December 29th, 30th, 31st, that's the Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We'll get done Saturday at noon so you can be, get back on the road, be at your meeting or home or wherever you want to be. hope you'll come to that. I think it's interesting. I've been uh, I'm studying Winston Churchill right now. He's one of my heroes. I really like him. And he was about to turn 25 and... And he was like, I've got to get it done. He was panicking because he's going to be 25 and he hadn't uh, uh, accomplished anything. He like he makes a lot of funny statements. In his first book, he wrote it and he sent it to his mother. And he said, Mother, comment on my book and tell me what you think of it. Don't tell me the truth. Tell me what I want to hear. <laughs> Make me feel good when you read my book. Another time he said, another time he said, I know that history will treat me kindly. Because I intend to write the history. <laughs> so anyway, I just think it's interesting. We're not the only ones with all these frustrations and all these things. Looks like we have a couple of questions here real quickly before we sit down. Go ahead. Uh, Raleigh Hill says, uh, how often should you evaluate your plan? Weekly? Quarterly? Won't you answer it first and then I'll answer it. Well, what I think and probably what I do are two different things. Yeah. I... Um, I think it's good to reevaluate. I don't know that I would put it necessarily a weekly or quarterly schedule on it, but I would say every once in a while, just revive that, uh, rekindle it and say, you know, I need to think through this. Uh, what am I? Who am I supposed to be? What do I want to work at? And every once in a while, just do that. I don't know that I would put it necessarily a date to it. I tend to take a, uh, I tend to take a, I always take my hand. I show people this, this level of be, do, serve, train. I tend to take every so often and just look at it and say, uh, is this really what I want to do? Is this really who I want to be? I don't know that I have any kind of weekly or monthly plan. I just kind of constantly remind myself, I need to check and see if I'm accomplishing what I'm supposed to accomplish. Uh, let me say real quick, I'll read the other questions. Um, I think it's Stephen Covey said, if you want to look at where you're going to get at the end, go ahead and look at what your schedule is today, what you're doing in your tasks today. And I think it is good for all of us to think about uh, what do we want? Who do we want to be? Where do we want to get to? What are our goals? And uh, reevaluate those things, but then make sure that they play out in your your daily um, your daily walk or your you know your schedule, whatever you're doing. Dustin Brown has a question. Says, how much time would you use reading and studying books every week? Well, I think that's a great question. First of all, I think maybe an hour a day of just personal growth reading. I mean, you got sixty hours, five hours a week. It's not too much. Uh, Audible is a fantastic app, and you can get uh, books and you can listen to them uh, on the way to and from places or when you're walking. So you got podcasts you can be listening to. You can listen to Leadership with Vision. You can listen to others. We highly recommend Sortiology uh, 101. Uh, and then you can listen to books. And so honestly, we live in a day and time when you can learn when you're not even supposed to be learning. There are so many things at your disposition, uh, at your disposal. Um, you know, I mean, like Pastor said, you got audio, you got people, you've got books, you've got so many things you can um, that you can grow from. Kevin White says, um, a minute ago you were talking about delegating things so you can do what is most important. One of the mistakes that I made was to give people responsibilities without preparing them or holding them accountable. It ended up being wor more work in the end because I didn't do a good job in the beginning. Oh yeah, I think that is exactly right, Kevin. I think that's good that you are vulnerable and transparent enough to admit that and say that so others can learn from it. I've done the same thing and so you have to make sure you do everything slowly and hold them accountable and help them grow. What a good comment, thank you, sir. Amen. All right, do you have anything else there, Jeff, before we leave? I think that's all the all the comments for right now, isn't it? Yes, yep. sir, that's correct. All right, well, thank you all very much for listening. Uh, we really enjoy the opportunity of talking to you and to count it a great honor and a privilege. Hope you've enjoyed it today. 
Uh, we, I think we only got 10 comments today, so maybe we were a little more boring or I don't know uh, exactly. One thing I like about having Jeff along is I can get to blame part of it on him. <laughs> if I did, if it, if you didn't uh, know hearts and claps and liking what we were doing. So anyway, there it is. Thank you so much for listening today. Please pray for the summit that people would come. Please pray for the construction at Vision. Uh, right now, everything is just about wrapping up, but the grass and the uh, asphalt to going down is a little bit of a problem. John Pearson's leaving to go to Bosnia, so he's under a lot of pressure. Every day he's having to go to the church to make sure things are working out. So please be in prayer for them. Thank you so much, all of you who listen, and uh, God bless you very much. Jeff, any final words? Amen. Well, I appreciate very much uh, your time. Check us out, worldevangelism.net. You can find an archive of all the Leadership with Vision podcasts, a lot more other information. Um, we would love to see you. Visionmissions.com, you can find out more about the summit. Uh, thanks so much for your time, and we appreciate it very much. God bless every one of you.